Hey, Vikings fans. Welcome back to Vikings.com. I'm Viking team reporter Eric Smith, joined now by the one and only Viking tight end Kyle Rudolph. Rudy, thanks a lot for joining us today. How's it going, man? Uh, it's going well. We're getting used to this nor new normal around our house and uh, trying to get into a groove with the kids and keeping them up on their activities and also for us as parents. You know, it's certainly odd and a unique time for all of us. But one thing that's not different, you know, is your involvement in the community. You know, that's been going on, you know, ever since you arrived in, in Minnesota and with the Vikings. Um, you know, that, that's been important to you. And I guess just explain kind of what you're doing right now with uh, Second Harvest Heartland and, and that initiative. Well, we've worked with Second Harvest Heartland in the past, and we know the impact that they have right here in the Twin Cities community. And uh, we know what they've done in the past for food insecure families. Uh, and that's all been magnified with everything that's going on right now. And whether it's kids who are not in school and thus unable to get meals or families who were food insecure to begin with, and now mom and or dad aren't working, so they really aren't sure where that next meal is going to come from. And, um, you know, we, we launched an initiative, uh, a meal plan to try to provide meals to, you know, try to provide over a half a million meals. I think it's just over 600,000 meals. And uh, in order to reach that goal, we felt as though we had to start things off in a big way. And by starting that off, we wanted to donate 82,000 meals. Obviously, 82 is a number that's very significant in our family, and we felt like that would show everyone else in the community that we're serious about this goal, and we want to do everything possible. In just over two weeks, we've raised about $83,000, and we're almost halfway to our goal. Uh, it's been unbelievable to have so much support from the Twin Cities community, but also the state of Minnesota, and really Vikings fans all across the world. Yeah, that's great. That's wonderful to hear. I'm sure your reputation around here probably has a bit to do with that, you know, and that kind of includes your end zone at the, at the Children's Hospital. I'm, I'm not sure if you, you probably haven't personally been there in a time like this, but have you heard how that's kind of maybe helping people kind of brighten their days right now? So that's another thing that we had to, uh, you know, as most people are doing right now, you, you have to adjust, you have to adapt. And being that the end zone is a public space in the hospital, it wasn't a space that they could remain open and the end zone was shut down along with the Zucker family broadcast suite and some of the other areas where patients at the hospital were able to escape the reality of the medicine and, you know, really get out of their room. So uh, one of the things that we tried to do and my wife, Jordan kind of spearheaded this initiative was just getting as many games, books, toys, um, card games, things that we could find, you know, from local stores here in town. You know, I felt like we had a Target package showing up at the house every single day with uh, board games, books, puzzles, things that we could then take down to the hospital. So these kids would have things in their room that they could then take their mind off the medicine, take their mind off the treatment because they aren't able to go down to the end zone. Right, right. You guys are always coming through, even even in times like this. Um, you know, we there's some uncertainty. You know, I know the the NFL offseason has been delayed a little bit. You know, the Vikings are supposed to get back April 20th for their voluntary offseason program. That's kind of on pause right now. You know, how how does this kind of affect you and the team? You know, you, this is the point where you're supposed to be getting back together with the guys, and and that's kind of on hold. Yeah, you know, as I mentioned before. You know, it's, it's my responsibility to be physically ready whenever that time does come when we get back together. But, you know, for us as a team, uh, you know, it, for the first year and, you know, really the last six years under Coach Zimmer, uh, we're going to have a lot of new faces and we're going to have a lot of new players that haven't been around here. And, you know, that's a very opportune time for us and time that we need to get together, that we need to be together. And uh, it's not looking like we're going to have. So, you know, with that, you know, it just puts more responsibility on the leaders in our locker room to make sure that, you know, whether we're getting information out to guys, um, you know, maybe trying to get together on our own, uh, doing things that we can once it's safe to, to, to be able to make up for, for lost off season. And it reminds me a lot of what things were like in 2011, uh, going into a season after the lockout when we just reported to training camp in late July. There were no off season workouts, no OTAs, no mini camp. 
Um, so if that is the case, um, you know, for me personally, I went through it. Um, I've gone through an off season without an off season. Uh, and I'd be able to be there for younger guys who may not know what to do during times like this. And it's my job as a leader in the locker room to, to help guide them and, and to make sure that whenever we do get back together as a team, uh, we're ready to go. Uh, Gary Kubiak is now the offensive coordinator. He's someone that you guys know. Is there a benefit to that? You, you guys know Gary. You, you kind of know his scheme and his system. So offensively, is that going to be a help? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you hit the nail on the head, Eric. It's, it's our first time in five years where we will have the same system two years in a row. Uh, so, you know, you think back through all the transitions that we've had on the offensive coaching staff, all the different play callers, they've each had their own way of calling things. They've each had their own system. And when Gary came over last year, he implemented his system. And, you know, for us, it'll provide a little continuity and it'll allow us to pick up to where we left off last year. And, you know, when you go through an off season, you're always going back and kind of, you know, stripping everything down to the, the nuts and bolts and relearning. Uh, but it will allow us to accelerate the learning a little bit because it is a system that we're familiar with. We wanted to ask you about the draft. That's obviously on the forefront of a lot of people's minds right now it's coming up. If you think back to your draft, you know, a second round pick, Anything stand out to you for, for draft day memories or a funny story that from that time that, that you uh, want to share? Um, well, you know, so for me, uh, it was the second year, I believe, that they moved it from a Saturday-Sunday draft to a Thursday-Friday-Saturday draft. Um, so I remember watching on Thursday, anticipating on going somewhere late in the night on Thursday, uh, not being drafted, being extremely frustrated that I wasn't drafted. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then happened to go to sleep and wake up and wait all day the next day uh, to hear my name called then on Friday night. And it actually had got to the point where we were a few picks in on Friday. And again, I thought I was going to go pretty early on Friday and didn't go. So after about five or six picks on Friday, uh, obviously I was sitting at the house watching with my family. And the Reds were playing that night in town. And I was like, let's just go to the Reds game. I've got my phone. If I get drafted tonight, I will get a phone call and we'll know where I'm going. So we rallied the family. We were getting ready to leave the house to go down to the Reds game. And my phone rang, a Minnesota area code. Minnesota was a team that I had not formally met with. I really hadn't talked to anyone outside of the tight end coach, Jimmy Johnson, at the time. Uh, in those real informal meetings at the Combine. Uh, so for me, I never thought Minnesota was going to be a possibility. And it's funny how things work out. Um, I wouldn't have wanted things to go any other way. Now being here for coming up on 10 years, uh, having three kids here, establishing our family here, uh, I'm glad that no one else took me and let the Vikings get me at 43. Did you ever make it to the Reds game or no? We did end up going to the Reds game after I got off the uh, Rick and, and Coach Leslie Frazier. Um, a, a more recent memory, you know, that, that Viking, the Vikings fans, you know, love to talk about even even after the season was your, your game-winning catch against New Orleans in overtime. You know, it, can you kind of reflect back on that and, and how big of a moment that was for the team? Oh, uh, you know, whenever I tell this story or, or talk about that game, uh, the thing that always comes to my mind was the week leading up to the game, uh, just the preparation of our coaching staff, the 53 guys on our team, the guys on practice squad, uh, just how mentally locked in everybody was, knowing that no one on the outside was really giving us much of a chance. And, you know, I always add, rightfully so. You're going into the Superdome to play against Sean Payton and Drew Brees, and not a lot of people win there in the playoffs. So uh, we knew as a team that we were gonna have to play near perfect on all three phases to get a win. And, you know, just going throughout the course of the week, how hard guys prepared, the work that they put in, and then all of that culminating with a win in the Superdome in overtime, and just everybody celebrating in the locker room together. You know, that's what sticks out more to me than making the game winning catch in overtime. It's It was being in the locker room with all of our guys and. Uh, you know, we had been together working since the middle of April for that game, and it gave us an opportunity to play another one the following week. 
you know, lots of, it, like every season, you know, lots of highs, lots of lows. I think one of my personal, two personal favorite memories from last year was, was your pair of one-handed catches, you know, touchdown catches. I think one was against Dallas and, and one against Seattle. Do you have a, a favorite of those two? And, you know, I know you have a, a hoops background. Did, did that kind of come into play there? Absolutely. I, I mean, I think there's a ton of carryover between uh, basketball and playing the tight end position. You see so many guys, you know, whether it's all the way back to Tony Gonzalez, who played basketball at Cal. Uh, obviously, everyone knows Antonio Gates' story playing basketball at Kent State before he got in the NFL. Jimmy Graham, former basketball player. There's just a lot of guys who have a basketball background. And I think the skill set definitely translates between basketball and, and catching passes as a tight end. So uh, I definitely think it helped. Um, but, you know, to pick a favorite, uh, I'm not really sure. They both, you know, the, the Dallas one was early in the game, kind of getting things started for us. You know, we, we scored first to get off to a fast start. And then the Seattle one was towards the end of the game when we were coming back, uh, you know, gave us an opportunity to have the ball in two minutes at the end of the game with a chance to win it. So, uh, you know, for me, you get so caught up in the flow of the game, you don't really have time to, to think about the impact that catches have. Uh, you know, I just I say it all the time when whenever the ball comes my way, uh, I do everything I can to catch it. Uh, that's my responsibility to help our team win games. Rudy, uh, for your efforts for the uh, second Harvest Heartland, is there a link that fans can go to to help donate and help support this cause? They can. You know, if they want to get behind our initiative and, and support the meal plan, there's a link in both of my social media profiles on Instagram and Twitter at Kyle Rudolph 82, where you can click on, it will take you directly to our meal plan page. And it even breaks it down in terms of uh, what your dollars can go to. You can select what kind of food you want to provide, uh, or you can just give a flat donation. And for perspective, a hundred dollar donation, which doesn't seem like a whole lot can feed a family of four for an entire month. So you know, if you think about it, break it down even further, just $25 can feed one person for an entire month. So every little bit helps. All right, Rudy. Well, we definitely appreciate your time and, and all of our best wishes to you, Jordan, and, and the rest of the family. Thank you. I appreciate it.